Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are looking to bounce from an ugly Tuesday. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue. Quarterly beats getting little reward. Overall, look, earnings are, are not uh, that bad. Individual company earnings look quite solid. We have about 80% uh, of companies beating estimates. But that's not helping the share prices right now. We're well, seeing very different type of reaction uh, depending on, on, on earnings. Any slight earnings, guidance, weakness, they're sold, and they're sold hard. Investors punish their miss pretty drastically. People aren't asking questions. They're just saying adios. The buy side was already you know, rather pessimistic coming into this earnings season. We have now um, on deck all the mega cap tech names. There is a need to rip off the Band-Aid and deal with some of these back half forecasts. It's a pretty critical week. You've got all the overhang of what's happening in China. We've had a tremendous backup in yields. It's not a great backdrop right now. You may be having to live in sort of this macro driven world right now with a ton of macro uncertainty joining us is crossmarks bob doll and katie kaminsky of alpha simplex katie it has been a rough tough ride for the nasdaq for this market over the last month and in fact year to date as well your read on what's driving this for me it's really a long-term versus short-term issue Longer term, we're seeing the pressure of interest rates be the bigger problem. And yes, some earnings are good, but the truth is longer term issues are not resolved. So any sort of sense of weakness is going to be jumped on. And I think yesterday, just how extreme the move was kind of showed that and that people are nervous. They're nervous about what's going to happen if interest rates do hold. And we haven't even seen anything happen yet, really. So I think that's why we're seeing that weakness in the NASDAQ. Bob Dole, you were nervous. You were bearish, much more bearish than I've ever heard you in the years that I've known you. You were bearish coming into this, and you are saying now that cyclical risks are increasing. They're not decreasing. Why is that, Bob? Um, interest rates, that's the whole story. Uh, March 31st, 10-year Treasury year was 232. Last Friday, got to 292. I know we backed off some, but that 232 is up from 151 on December 31st and up from 50 basis points two years ago. The stock market cannot handle on a valuation basis this pace of interest rate increase. That's the major issue in my view. Why can't the banks get it done with these kind of increases? I'm just going through the year-to-date moves in the likes of JP Morgan and elsewhere. And Bob Dole, they are ugly, ugly, ugly. JP's down 22% year-to-date. Citigroup's down 16.8%, Bank of America down 18 percentage point. Why has it been that bad for those names? So I, I'm, I think where you are, I, I'm adding to them. I feel like I'm catching a falling knife, uh, but it, it's all about recession fears. If interest rates go up, that's generally good news for banks, unless we're going to have a recession, and then you want to sell the bank. So I'm betting no recession until the second half of 2023. I'm looking at a dollar that's ever stronger, up six-tenths of 1%, the DXY at a five-year high. The dollar index just short of a 103 handle as I speak at 102.90. KT, the strength in this one, can you see anything else getting stronger against it in the near term? Well, there's been some dispersion. I'd say the biggest driver of this is the euro. So take a look at the euro, and the euro is very weak today. It's hit some of its support levels, and we're seeing sort of that relative valuation difference across the board where the U.S. is just looking a little stronger than other areas. I think this dispersion we've seen related to carry in terms of certain EM currencies also dissipated when recession fears, fears drove the market prices down. So I'd say the dollar has just been the biggest winner and the biggest trend this week, uh, although we've seen some reversion in other asset classes. Euro dollar right now, 105 handle, 105 57 equity futures positive just about four tenths on the s p what a week for earnings a little bit later after the close facebook tomorrow amazon and apple 80 percent of the s p topping estimates so far many of them kelly lines getting very little reward yeah that's absolutely true john by and large earnings season has actually shaped up to be 
really quite strong when you look at the number of companies that are beating on average, beating on profits by around 6%. And the vast majority of them are seeing growth on both the top and bottom line. But as you suggest, met with very little reward in this market. The average one-day move post-earnings for the companies reported thus far down by about half of 1%. And when you look at the equity benchmarks as a whole so far this earnings season, since J.P. Morgan kicked things off two weeks ago today, they are down across the board. The Dow down about 3%, the S&P by 6 that Russell 2000 around there as well. But for tech, it has been even more brutal. The NASDAQ 100 index yesterday falling to its lowest level in almost a year since May of 2021. It is now down about 21% year to date. That, that decline really rivals what we saw back in the peak pandemic era fear back in March of 2020. That decline was around 25%. And of course, with mixed results from Microsoft and Alphabet after the bell yesterday, we'll see what kind of influence the rest of the tech companies reporting throughout this week will have on the market as a whole, John. Kelly Lines, looking forward to it. Thank you. This quote from Bank of America got my attention this morning. This is what it said. The Fed is likely to shift from a source of volatility to one of more stability over the coming months. A more certain Fed should help lower rates vol and provide confidence to the market. Greater rate certainty should give investors more comfort to lean long duration. Now, Bob, would that bring you comfort on the equity side if we could get over sure that would. uncertainty around this Fed? Sure would, John. If you could ju just tell me rates are going to just stay here for a while, I think the equity market can begin to pay attention to the good earnings. Uh, you know, our view is this, this year is a tug of war. The tailwinds, earnings, the headwinds, valuations, and valuation is the whole story right now, and it's directly related to the pace of interest rate increases. Have you got a decent understanding of who wins out that tug of war this year, Bob? Yeah, so uh, we called for a down year in December, um, but not our, our target is 45.50, which is actually a nice gain from here, John. But uh, if, if that's where we end up, the, uh, the, the, the headwinds of valuation uh, will win the race, and that's what's happened so far this year, obviously. Katie, that's what's happened in this equity market. From a bond market perspective, it's pretty clear that over the next few months, on a year-over-year -year basis, we'll get this so-called mechanical peak in CPI in America. Should that bring people comfort? even if we have this prolonged period of above target of inflation at this Fed? And can we move past this Federal Reserve? Well, let's be clear. Over the next few meetings, I think we have a decent understanding of what this Fed will do. 50-50 and maybe again 50. From there, that, Katie, is where the uncertainty is, isn't it? That's correct. Um, I think the challenge is we have a long way to go. And the current situation with higher inflation, whether or not it's peaked or not, is that inflation is challenging. It's insidious. It goes into different places and it causes issues across the board. Couple that with supply chain and scarcity issues in the commodity markets. We're sort of in a headwind of an environment where the Fed has every incentive to make this ride smooth. And so I think the goal would be that this is a smooth ride and that the ex equity markets can waiver it. Um, I think we're a little concerned more that if that doesn't end up the case and we have a little bit more challenge, we might have a good probability of some sort of reversal or recession. Hence the market's behavior yesterday. I mean, it's definitely a real risk. Take some comfort from yesterday that it was a classic risk off move and then risk on this morning. Equities up this morning. Yields up this morning. Yesterday, yields down, equities down. Bob Dole, the problem we've had more recently, though, over the last several months is that the backdrop has hit both stocks and hit bonds as well. Is that a dynamic, Bob, you think is here to stay? I, I don't think so, John. Back to your comment, if, if the Fed stabilizes things or is able to stabilize things. Look, come back to the inflation story. Inflation was two. It's now eight. My guess it ends the year around four, to use round numbers. And I think that decline in inflation, should we peak here in the second quarter, as many of us are expecting, that will give some pause to this bearish noise around valuation. And we could get we could get some trades. I, I don't know that they're uh, they're lasting, but um, uh, I, I find myself trying to defend the bulls at 4,200 on the S&P. Well, Bob, if we get down to four on inflation, where's nominal growth? Where's real growth? Where do you see GDP landing year end? Uh, I, I think we will have a year that's uh, two and a half to three. Um, the problem is, is it still decelerating as we end this year going into next year? And do we have a recession? That's what the, uh, what the market is uh, dealing with now. And of course, we don't know those answers. Is that a world you'd like to buy the NASDAQ in? <laughs> Not just yet. Not just yet. So uh, NASDAQ and tech can, can be in the same sentence. I think there are three parts of tech. High P.E., um, tech that is long duration equities has gotten horribly punished. Not interesting to me. 
The mega cap uh, stocks mixed, as you pointed out, um, I, I think it's the old value tech companies that are selling much cheaply. That's where you have to hang out and tech in this environment. Let's move in this NASDAQ down 3.9% yesterday. We were looking at a bounce this morning. It was about 1%. Now we're negative. On the month, we're down 12%. On the year, on the NASDAQ 100, we are down 20 percentage points. Bob Dole, Kelly Kaminsky sticking with us. Going into the opening bell, let's get you some movers. It's Taylor Riggs. John, it was interesting. 24 hours ago, you were talking with Dan Ives over at Wedbush and really talking about how he was focused on Microsoft and the cloud. And indeed, of course, some of what he said there certainly rang true when we got those quarterly results. Cloud here, of course, within Microsoft, a huge sort of outperformer here for the company. Um, otherwise, though, maybe some spots of weakness, but the stock price certainly up about 4% this morning. GM also to the upside this morning, uh, certainly looking at the company this morning after reaffirming that full year guidance. Is the chip shortage finally easing? Maybe investors trying to take some uh, good news out of that. To the downside a little bit, John, I want to be careful here because overall Alphabet felt pretty good. But again, if you talk about sort of the high expectations for YouTube and some of the ad services there, maybe it's being hurt a little bit by some of the competition. And then, of course, some of the uh, macroeconomic concerns coming out of Europe. Speaking of macroeconomic concerns, it's Boeing, a complicated company, but echoing similar comments of GE Raytheon, highlighting sort of inflation, war, and maybe that's offsetting some of the good news, a really worse than expected sort of free cash flow burn and, and worse uh, than expected loss here on the bottom line. There are enough excuses out there if you need them right now, that's for sure. Taylor, thank you. A close to $2 billion miss on revenue at Boeing. Not pretty. Coming up, the energy standoff between Russia and Europe. Our guidance here is very clear to pay in rubles, if this is not foreseen in the contract, to pay in rubles is a breach of our sanctions. Unfortunately, right now, there is nothing clear about the energy situation in Europe. That conversation, next. guidance here is very clear. To pay in rubles, if this is not foreseen in the contract, to pay in rubles is a breach of our sanctions. We have around about 97% of all contracts that explicitly stipulate payments in euros or dollars. Companies with such contracts should not accede to the Russian demands. This would uh, be a breach of the sanctions, so a high risk for the companies. Russia cutting off gas supplies to Poland and Bulgaria until payments are made in rubles. The German economy minister said this. The country's gas supply is, quote, we are doing everything to keep it that way. It is, quote, stable right now. We need to make sense of something I don't think we can make sense of. Maria Tadeo of Bloomberg joined us in Brussels and AMH down in D.C. Maria, can you make sense of what is going on? Why Poland and Bulgaria have been cut off. The Russians are saying you only get gas if you pay in rubles. And Ursula von der Leyen is saying no one can pay in rubles. It's very unclear, uh, Jonathan. The only thing that's clear at this hour is that this is a major escalation between Russia and uh, the European Union. And a lot of this is political. Of course, Poland has been incredibly hawkish on the Russian government, and then they had their gas cut off. The same happened with Bulgaria, which did not comply with that demand to pay in rubles. So we are seeing that Russia is making good on this threat. And by the way, we always knew that this was going to be the most delicate time in the saga, the end of April, beginning of May. Now, if you're a European company, right now it is very difficult Jonathan to navigate the space because the head of the commission is giving you a very clear guidance do not pay in rubles this is something that the Russians are doing to prop up their economy and their currency that would be in breach of our sanctions but of course at the same time companies believe that there is a gray area in which they pay in euros and gas from will convert it into rubles for them and of course you have the big threat from the Russians now saying if you don't pay we will make good on this you're not going to get your gas we've seen it in Poland we've seen it in Bulgaria. The one thing I would note, however, Jonathan, is that we're not really expecting any cut-offs from gas supplies from Russia in for the time being, excuse me. If anything, it would be at the end of May. So for the time being, it does seem that the situation in Germany is stable, but I would remind everyone that Poland, just like Ukraine, is a transit country for Russian gas. Maria, let's take a beat. Let's go through this together. Our reporting suggests that four European gas buyers made ruble payments to Russia. A person close to Gazprom said 10 buyers opened ruble accounts. Now, I'm trying to understand why Poland and Bulgaria got cut off 
You've got Ursula von der Leyen saying that you can't make payments in rubles. We're reporting those payments have been made. Because surely, if the Russians are saying they need to be paid in rubles and you don't get your gas if you don't, then that makes sense for Poland and Bulgaria to be cut off. Why has no one else been cut off? Have they been paying in rubles? Look, what we know is that four have decided they would be open for this. We know that Hungary said already on the record that they would pay in rubles and they didn't see an issue with that. And then the question is, who are the other three? We did get a comment from the Austrian chancellor saying it was not Austria. I remember at one point it was suggested that the country uh, could do that. So for the time being, this is a guessing game in terms of who are the other three. Now, when it comes to the other 10 accounts, these are European companies. So it's not countries, it is companies. Now, if you ask me, why is this happening with Poland. Clearly, it is political. This is a government uh, led by the Polish prime minister who is incredibly hawkish on Russia, who was sending tanks, by the way, at the start of uh, the week. And then when you go to Bulgaria, it's a small economy, doesn't do a lot of damage, but it sends a very clear signal that other countries could come next. Anne-Marie, if you had to explain to people in Washington what on earth was going on with the Europeans in this gas situation with Russia, what would you tell them? <laughs> I would tell them it's quite complicated, and this is something I imagine the administration was expecting. This is something everyone knew President Putin had the ability to do. And what he is really doing, and Javier Blas wrote an opinion piece about this a month ago that potentially we could see, is he is dumping the Europeans before they have the chance to dump him. This was almost inevitable, right? Putin has been saying for weeks that you have to pay in rubles or we are going to cut off supplies. Now, Maria is talking about a potential gray area. It does seem to see, be that some companies are using that gray area. And what Putin is really doing by forcing these companies to set up these banks, at, uh, accounts at Gazprom banks, yes, you can pay in euros and U.S. dollars. Gazprom bank will take care of the FX uh, trade and exchange, but that then protects Gazprom bank from any sort of sanctions because you cannot sanction the bank if you're reliant on them doing these transactions to make sure you get some supplies. What the U.S. is doing, Jonathan, is what we've known basically since March. President Biden said this alongside Ursula von der Leyen, that they're going to send 15 billion cubic meters this year of LNG. But that is really tiny compared to what Europe needs. AMH, thank you. Down in D.C., Maria Tadeo, over in Brussels. Maria, happy birthday for yesterday. I forgot you weren't here, so I couldn't thank tell you. Thank you so much. My pleasure, our pleasure. Thank you very much. The situation in Europe continues for many people to be absolutely embarrassing. The situation for the ECB and President Lagarde getting increasingly difficult, stuck between a rock and a hard place. The rock, high inflation, the hard place, decelerating growth. Will we see a recession? Mark Hayfley of UBS is optimistic. He says the following. The Russian gas export developments out of Europe are a reminder of the potential for escalation. However, Europe still has many diplomatic and fiscal policy responses available to prevent an energy-induced recession. Their base case, no European recession. Katie Kaminsky, do you agree or disagree? Well, I think we won't know the answer to that for a while. But what we do know is that this narrative of inflation is much more at play because the scarcity, the issues related to oil prices, the volatility we're seeing there is going to continue to plague investors and companies. Um, I think right now we're in a standoff situation, which is never a good situation for supply chains. So I think that's where I view it, is that, yes, a recession could always be an issue, but right now it's still just very unclear. It's very volatile, and um, we'll have to wait and see. Bob Dole, for much of this year, the only sure bet in this equity market was energy. Energy in the commodity market, energy equities. If we're going to see growth decelerate, are you expecting energy stocks to hold up too? I think they will, will experience more profit taking like we've seen in recent days. They were up 40% at their peak take a little money off the table. What about you, Katie? Where do you stand on that story? So energy is still very bullish on our side, but energy was extremely extended until early March. And so what I would say is that we're still sort of seeing some influence of, you know, technical signals saying that energy is still going to remain high, uh, but we're definitely a little more tepid in terms of the fact that there's a lot more volatility related to demand issues. I mean, I know we were talking about what was going on in China recently more. That's not the narrative today, but now the narrative is Europe. So I'd say that we're kind of seeing a lot more of a somewhat of a potential inflection point for this trade, but it's still consolidating. Katie, awesome to catch up alongside Bob Dole to break down this situation, which right now is incredibly difficult to break down. Bob Dole and Katie Kaminsky. Your euro 
is deeply negative, a 105 handle on euro dollar. Adam Ruskin had this to say. This is the euro's problem in a nutshell. He said, based on market pricing, even if the Fed stops tightening in June 22, just a few months away, the US is expected to have higher rates than the euro through the whole of 2023. And there is a difference between rate hikes in the near term and the prospect of rate hikes down the road. He said the value of a bird in the hand, rate hikes soon, rate hikes assured, has gone up as the value of a bird in the bush, possible rate hikes far in the future, has gone down because of increased long term uncertainties. What we do know in the near term is that we get Fed hikes. In the longer term, the ECB, I've got no idea what this ECB can deliver. And that's the problem for this euro, weaker for a fifth straight session with a 105 handle. Remember, 103 was the low of the last 10 years for euro dollar. That was late 2016, early 2017. And as we've said repeatedly on this program, for the ECB at that time, that was a policy goal, an objective to get a weaker currency to do something about inflation that back then was too low. This time, that's not a policy goal. That is a problem. Coming up in the morning calls and later, Alphabet reporting a rare earnings miss with slowing ad sales starting to bite. The conversation still ahead with KeyBank's Justin Patterson. Looking forward to that with that stock down about 3.7%. And equity futures, this is not the pop you woke up to. Futures are only up two tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. They were higher by about 1%. And the Nasdaq has been dipping in and out of negative territory through the last 20 minutes from New York. This is Bloomberg. This equity market bounce does not stick. Right now, we're just about positive on the Nasdaq. We turn negative on the Russell, on the S&P 500, up about a quarter of 1%. Into the bond market, the shape of things as follows on twos, tens and thirties. Yields were much higher than this a little bit earlier. Now up just four basis points on a two-year, 251.81, and about 25 basis points below the highs of the year, which were only a week ago. That's the price action here in the morning calls. First up, JP Morgan downgrading JetBlue to underweight from overweight, citing low confidence in management's ability to get higher prices is under control. That stock is down another 2.7%. Next up, Piper Sandler downgrading Capital One to neutral, 143 price target, expecting muted earnings growth for the next couple of years. And finally, Wolf Research raising its Microsoft price target to 350 after earnings, highlighting the company's impressive guidance and solid demand. Coming up, the street rewarding Microsoft for its results, but a different story for Alphabet. That conversation up next with KeyBank's Justin Patterson. That stock is down 3.7%. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 24 seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning to you. We were looking for a bounce earlier on. We don't have that bounce right now. On the Nasdaq, we are just about positive by 0.05%. On a Russell, we're negative. On the S&P, up a quarter of 1%. And yesterday was absolutely brutal. Let's see up and bounce, switch up the board and get to the bond market. Yield just a little bit higher at the front end and through the curve, up three basis points. But even that move fades, 275.51. Euro dollar now down nine tenths of 1%. This is a fifth straight day of euro weakness. Euro dollar 105.41. Crude just about holding on to a 100 handle, 125. We are negative 1.4% and down about a dollar and 50 cents so far. About 20 seconds into the session, let's break this one down for you. Information technology does bounce back a little bit, up eight or nine tenths of 1%. The S&P, though, up a little more than a tenth. Let's call it two tenths of 1% higher. With more, here's Candy Lines. Well, the lead in the technology sector today is Microsoft. That was the good news story from the tech reports we got after the bell yesterday. Beats on the top and bottom line. Thank you very much to the cloud. That was really the driving horse, uh, force behind 18% growth uh, on revenue. The 19th straight quarter of double-digit sales growth for that company. But sales picture not so great for Alphabet. They're facing a lot of headwinds on the advertising front, including softness in the European market, weakness in YouTube with TikTok taking a bite out of that business, and also the Apple privacy rule change that have daunted other advertising reliant companies like Meta's Facebook. It'll be interesting to see how that one shakes out after the bell today. Elsewhere, Texas Instruments also reported yesterday the 
Shipmaker had to cut its forecast due to China's COVID zero policy that creating some supply constraints for that company. And finally, just to check on Twitter as well, it will be reporting tomorrow, but no conference call, John, because Elon Musk is coming in to buy the company. What's interesting, 5420 is the deal price. 4908 is where we trade at the opening bell. So clearly investors still a little hesitant around some of the risk, including where is he going to get the financing and what do regulators think about that one, John? Five dollars of doubt in the yeah. equity market right now. Kelly Lines, keep an eye on that one. Thank you. So Alphabet and Microsoft behind us. Taylor Riggs, three big names still right in front of us. <laughs> John, it's a countdown to the horse race, as you said. Some of the big ones down, still two big days to go. We'll start with today, of course, Meta. Qualcomm as well, certainly one that we're going to be watching when you think about the chip shortage and where we are with peak shortage behind us. And then, of course, a good read on the consumer. If you think about Apple and Amazon, a further chips here, of course, with Intel. Kaylee sort of correctly said no one really cares now about Twitter, given that that story is old when you think about the quarterly results. When you think big picture of what to watch for, some decent numbers here of course expected on the top line bottom line maybe looks a little bit squishy but i want to do a huge caveat here anurag rana writing in apple is going to generate north of 90 billion dollars in free cash flow this year amazon from the cloud business alone going to generate north of 20 billion dollars in operating profit so i want to be really careful when we think about sort of a declines here on the bottom line on a year over year basis when you just think about massive free cash flow these companies are generating what it means is sort of big picture. You take a look at the NASDAQ 100 and the forward PE uh, ratios here. And actually now relative to the S&P 500, some arguably might say it's starting to look cheap given the big, big, big declines here. You can see some big declines going back to about 2020 when you think of sort of valuations on a PE basis. Taylor Riggs, thank you. What a tough month it's been for the NASDAQ 100. Tough year so far as well, down by more than 20% or so, down about 20% right now. Google, Alphabet, down by four percentage points. KeyBank's Justin Patterson saying this, he adjusts his outlook. We're now lowering our earnings estimates to reflect elevated costs and ongoing investments. Justin Patterson joins us right now for more. Justin, your time is super valuable this time of the year, so thank you for giving it to us. Let's start there with the likes of Alphabet. You were a little bit cautious going into this anyway. Was what you expected in this number when it was released, these earnings, in the last 24 hours? Yeah, I'd say it was largely consistent with expectations. Search a bit better than we forecasted, reflecting the durability of direct response advertising, product innovation, whereas YouTube was the big negative variance for our model. That was a function of a softer brand advertising environment, pullbacks from Europe, a difficult comp, both from a year-over-year -year perspective and the Apple platform changes. Now there's this open-ended debate of whether TikTok is having an impact. So when I roll those factors together, throw in the FX weakness, the uh, the uh, where the euro is at currently, that's what gets to a you know revenue forecast that doesn't change that much, and earnings growth largely the same. Justin Ruth Poirat has arguably transformed this company when it comes to buybacks. Ruth Poirat delivered another one yesterday. Is that not making a difference here? Can you help me understand just capital returns and what it means for the stock? Yeah, so there's two pieces in there. So if I look at just overall operating income growth, that was very healthy this past quarter, uh, roughly 20%. Where you saw more of the variation was actually below the line at the uh, interest and financial income level, where you just have various investments that are getting the negative mark, and thus you have EPS growth look a little more muted. The buyback helps insulate that over the course of the year. If you look at Google, it's nearly given all of free cash flow generation back to the buyback. So that's why I'm not too concerned about the stock here. There's just a very strong balance sheet, still very healthy free cash generation. As we work through some tough comps on 2022, a little more macro uncertainty, you start to get back to a more normal earn earnings growth profile next year. Justin, I've got a few other names to rattle through, whip through with you. It's just something that jumped out for me on the Bloomberg. Just to see 54 analysts on Alphabet with 54 buys and zero holds and zero sales. Does that make you uncomfortable at all, just how big the consensus is around this single name at the moment? Yeah, so I would say Google has been the most consensus long within the group so far. That just reflects the durability of the business, whereas you saw Meta, whereas you saw Snap face some incremental pressure from the platform changes uh, by Apple. You really just haven't had as much of a headwind within Google's business. Um, so more diversified, less platform pressure creates more, more durability toward the long-term free cash growth. 
In a market like this, where any softness does get sold, that cr could create a little bit of portfolio turnover here, but relative to others, uh, I think you have the least negative revision cycle risk uh, on Alphabet. Well, it's been sold hard. It's down 17% month to date, so it's been pretty brutal. Any read across here for Meta later, Justin, for you, if we learn anything from Alphabet, what it could mean for them? Yeah, I'd say combining these results plus Snap from last week, brand advertising a bit softer, so that's plus Europe. So that's one cautionary flag. And then as mentioned at the top of the hour, just the Euro remains a headwind, I think roughly 105 this morning. So that's one more factor that's going to weigh on reported revenue growth, making FX neutral growth the key variable to watch. You're perfectly positioned to help us answer the next question. The situation with Twitter, Justin, what are we learning about that situation? And does less censorship mean more difficulty with advertisers? And is that to the benefit of, say, Meta and Facebook? Yeah, there's a couple of interesting questions in there. One, just Twitter has 85% brand revenue exposure, and consensus is around 25% ad growth for this quarter. If the better quality assets are growing roughly around 25% right now, fair to assume that Twitter is more exposed to the negative revisions going forward, which kind of reinforces why management felt the, felt the need to sell. On just, does this change the competitive landscape? You know, TBD, Twitter is really a news platform more than anything else. So it has to go out, get the users engaged more uh, first. It sounds like Elon Musk has some plans for that. And if it can do that in a brand safe uh, manner, then perhaps the advertisers stick around. Right now, a lot more uncertainty, still a lot more content moderation that needs to be done. So I'd be cautious about just near-term pullbacks on spend on Twitter. Justin, what did you think about the fact that we get the earnings this week, but we don't get the earnings call? Any reaction to that from you? Does that tell you something about what we might get, or am I just being a little bit too cynical? Uh, a little more of the latter there. It's pretty standard practice that when a deal is taking place, uh, companies do pull the conference call. So I wouldn't read too much into that. Um, I will be curious to see if Twitter goes through its typical shareholder letter process or just keeps it as an investor brief. What do I read into a 48 handle on the stock in early trading this morning? What does that tell you, that spread? 48 now, the offer price, the agreed price, 54.20. It's very atypical to see that degree of spread for an all cash offer. So there's certainly doubts, whether that's just regulation or a view that perhaps Elon may be overpaying here and rethinking the bid. Probably more regulation concerns, but we'll see what transpires over the next few weeks. Justin, super busy. I know you've got a few more companies to cover through this earnings season. Justin Patterson there, KeyBank. Justin, thank you. Twitter down 1.8%, 48.80 in early trading. Coming up, a big week for U.S. data. It's going to come down to Friday's data. The employment cost index is, is going to be a very important data point for, for the Fed in terms of determining how much wage pressures are still in the system. The employment cost index this Friday, whether you'd call that a big week or not, I don't know. Michael Purvis might have tall back in. He joins us next. It's going to come down to Friday's data. The employment cost index is, is going to be a very important data point for, for the Fed in terms of determining how much wage pressures are still in the system. The ECI is, is the one that the Fed really hangs its hat on. That's the data coming up this Friday. How do you take a portfolio from $1.5 billion to $35 billion? The Arcagos founder, Bill Huang, and CFO Patrick Halligan charged with fraud over a multi-billion dollar mirage. Prosecutors saying both Huang and Halligan, quote, repeatedly made materially false and misleading statements about the portfolio of securities to numerous leading global investment banks 
and brokerages. Following this for much of the last year, Bloomberg's Shanali Basak. Morning, Shanali. Good morning, John. We have a situation which Bill Huang and his former CFO of Archegos were arrested this morning, and they're expected to appear in Manhattan court later today. We expect a press conference a little later this morning as well from the Southern District of New York. And we have a situation in which a lot of detail in an almost 60-page unsealed indictment is revealed about just how big Archegos got, his communications here with his own employees and other banks, and also the sheer size of the positions he took. Think about it. How much he owned of Viacom, GSX, and Discovery. These are huge stocks that are traded every day in normal markets. So we do know the losses, of course, that the banks had gone through, but now we are also seeing the extent to which Archegos had gone. And remember, they are being accused of market manipulation and fraud. Racketeering appears as well in this indictment. Now, the allegations. Have we got an idea, Shanali? of the defense and how embarrassing this might be for some of the names of those banks on that board. This is a great question here because we want to see what Bill Huang will say next. Will he counter sue in any fashion? Will the banks seek to reclaim any of their losses? Of course, there's kind of a tall order here in which the banks would try to reclaim some of those. We know there are other things going on in the background as well. The DOJ, the SEC, and other regulators keeping an eye on how this happened with the banks. Are there more regulations that need to be in place? And was there anything untoward that happened within the banks themselves? Remember, he amassed these positions on margin. He amassed them through swaps as well. So should there have been more clarity here? And also, should there have been more communications with regulators earlier on, John? That is still the looming question. There are some allegations regulators. here, Shanali, that some people might look at and read and say, well, I thought that was just normal practice. You get to 5%, you find other ways of building up a stake so you don't have to disclose it. Do you think there's going to be some nervous fund managers? around as well, Shanali. Fund managers, yes, because there are some funds that were named here, but they were not named exactly. They were they're said that there are funds in the background here. Remember, it's not just Archegos. There's a block trading uh, uh, investigation also going on in the background here in which both fund managers and prime brokerages are keeping an eye. And, you know, some of these stocks named, like Viacom, they involve huge, huge block trades. One more thing, it's not just the fund managers being nervous here. Companies being frustrated with what happened here. If you're Viacom, sure. if you're Discovery, and somebody amassed this much of your stock, where were the banks in letting you know what was going on? We did speak to some of the companies in which Archegos was an investor, and they did not get a lot of clarity at that time. So a lot of questions on how investors are able to amass positions this large. Fascinating story, just absolutely fascinating, and really looking forward to your coverage. It's going to take place, I imagine, not through the next few weeks, but perhaps through the next few years as well. Shanali Bassett, thank you. Our Wall Street correspondent on that story. Joining us now on this market, it has been tough over the last month, that's for sure. Tallbacken's Michael Purvis joins us now. With the S&P bouncing back by 1%, the Nasdaq up by 1.46. Michael, you're keen to make the point to compare the S&P equal weight with the S&P 500 market cap weight. What does that tell you? Well, the, uh, the S&P equal weight is all a, sort of a cyclical slash value proxy in a way, right? Because it takes the big tech stocks down to the same positions as some, you know, much smaller companies that are much more sort of economically sensitive and don't have the structural growth or the, the you know, the uh, fantastic uh, digital business models that that some of these big tech companies have have been. Uh, have have the uh, benefit of um, there, so so it's really just a a, a, a very simple way of saying value and growth, um, you, you know. But what what I think is interesting is that if you measure the equity risk premium for um, you know the various indices, the NAS, the NDX, the SPX, or the SPX equal weight, there's a there's a very large dispersion of where those um, equity risk premium are there and so i think you know we, you know we always sort of focus on the s p 500 that's where the conversation starts and stops but in terms of this relative valuation to treasuries discussion which is really what the erp the equity risk premium encapsulates um it, you know it's uh, those metrics are uh, are are really very different compared to the historic norm so the equal weight index has been a much easier buy than say you know certainly the the the, the nasdaq so, Michael, some people will wonder not whether it's time to buy the Nasdaq. That's the obvious question. Whether it's time to buy the cyclicals, the banks. 
The energies have done great. Let's talk about the banks because they've done really poorly. Sure. I've gone through the year-to-date figures on JP Morgan. We're down 22% on JP. On Citi, we're down 16. On Bank of America, we're down 17. It's been really, really difficult, even with the Fed story, which most people would have argued coming into this year would be supportive of these yeah. names, Michael. That trade has not worked. Is there any reason to believe it will work at some point this year? I, I, you know, John, uh, you look at Bank of America's valuation relative to the markets, it, it's it's at a pretty cheap level here. I don't understand the severity of the down move in banks. I've been buying um, the dip in, 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 in large cap uh, financials. The higher rate story um, should be very constructive. It seems to be that the recession is an inevitable narrative and, you know, that's just coming around the corner somehow. But I, I still struggle with that. I'm not you know, I'm really not on that. Recession is an obvious uh, base case in 2023. And so therefore, I'm much more comfortable um, holding the banks. If we do get a recession, um, you know, if that assumption ends up being wrong, I would expect it to be relatively minor and, 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 and brief there. So I think, you know, if you look, you know, yes, there's some correlation with the 210 curves and so forth of, of the performance of big bank shares. That there's some historical history, trading history there. But again, you know, I think Jamie Dimon will tell you this, that, that uh, you know, higher rates across the curve are, are much more constructive um, uh, there. You know, I think if you just open a, a simple bank account and we look at the interest rate, you get paid on that and turning around and buying two-year treasuries with that, it's a nice little um, arbitrage for those banks to, to lock up. I look uh, forward there. to seeing how, my, how much my interest goes on my deposits over the next couple of months yeah. the Fed moves 100 basis points. So I imagine it won't be anywhere near that amount. Michael, just looking forward from here, you said that's not my obvious base case for 2023. Do you think an obvious base case actually exists for next year? Well, that's a great question. I mean, there's, uh, I think this cycle, you know, I think one thing about this cycle is that there's massive distortions within the cycle. And, you know, I would argue that, the, you know, the rates market have kind of jumped to late cycle, really uh, a late cycle condition, you know, even early in 2021, equities, I, I'm arguing, are really kind of more mid-cycle there. And so you have these sort of odd sort of displacements right now. If you look at the projected earnings growth, not my earnings growth estimates, but but bottoms of consensus estimates compiled by Bloomberg, they're, um, they are, of course, not growing the way they were in 2021. But they're not, you know, the, 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 the earnings trajectory is really not looking at all like a recession is is sneaking around the corner um and and uh and and the the resilience of the earnings stream is really really pretty remarkable here so i keep coming back to you know the the equity hick the, the equity gyrations you know we've seen year to date well a it's coming after an incredibly strong 2021 where you had a fantastic nearly 30 percent rally in the s p 500 on top of a very strong 2020, right, and walking into a massive Fed pivot on, with a with a massive supply shock thanks to Ukraine, sort of exacerbating everything else. You know, year to date, the market's down 12 percent, John. That's really um, not that severe. Um, I think it's really a testament. I mean, people could say, "Yeah, okay, equities are being dumb." I'm sort of saying, "Well, maybe they're not so dumb. Maybe equities are that sort of a tell that that." Uh, there's a lot of um, you know inherent resilience when you're looking at nominal GDP, um, you know this year that could be you know well north of eight percent, very strong earnings for the larger companies that can manage their cost structures. Um, there with the back end of the you know the, the treasury curve that has been of course selling off aggressively, but if there's some stability that's found there in the next few months, I think you're going to start seeing a you know a much more constructive path forwards for equities. But no question, the near term cross asset volatilities are extremely high. The uncertainty factors will be high and and it's kind of a trader's market. I've been I've been playing this market long and short, um, you know, over the last uh, three months. Michael Purvis, a tallback and Michael, great to catch up, buddy. As always, I think most people would agree with Michael that we need race vol to settle down. Some stability there would be super helpful for the overall market. This morning, we advanced on the S&P by a little more than 1%. Information technology bouncing back by 2.76%. A lot of earnings coming up. After the close, we'll hear from Meta. Tomorrow, Amazon and Apple. Your trading diaries next.
yesterday was absolutely brutal going into the close. 25 minutes out of the open this morning, and good morning, we are positive. There's a bounce. Will it stick? The S&P up more than 1%, the Nasdaq 100 up by 1.35 percentage points. As the price action, here's the trading diary. The U.S. Attorney's Office holding a press conference on the Archegos charges. That's at 11.30 Eastern time, and it's back to big tech earnings with Meta reporting results after the closing bell. Apple, Amazon, Twitter all coming up tomorrow. Plus, a Bank of Japan rate decision, another round of initial jobless claims in first quarter U.S. GDP, and finally, rounding out the week with a read on wages and consumption this coming Friday. From New York, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.